Stephen George Bull. Born March the 28th, 1965, at 153 Leebrook Road, Wensbury, in the West Midlands. The third of six children and the eldest of two sons. When he was three years old, the Bull family moved to Tipton in the heart of the Black Country, and it was here at number two South Road that the young Bull grew up. His first football experiences were gained on the traffic island that serves as Wembley for the youngsters of South Road. Little realising that one day this would lead to his stepping out onto the genuine verdant turf of Wembley itself, representing his country at international level and playing alongside modern day footballing heroes like Gary Lineker, Paul Gascoigne, Brian Robson and Peter Shilton. Although never a top scorer academically, physical education was always high on the list of priorities for Steve Bull throughout his career, which began at Ocker Hill Infants and Wensbury Oak Junior Schools before moving to the local Willingsworth High, where he played in his first organised matches. Every footballer always says, I've always wanted to play football for as long as I can remember. When you were at school, was there anything else that came into your mind that you thought, I'd like to have a go at that? Not really. As I say, I was, I was out there as a old ball, you know what I mean? Boots tied up your, your shins, like whatever. I always wanted to do it, be an all in all uh, footballer. Nothing else ever come, come across. Did you have these great games in the playgrounds at lunchtime where you line up against the wall and pick sides? And well, you used to do, you, we used to do things like that. As I say, I used to go back, go back home with ripped trousers, grey shoes, new shoes, stuff like that, coat ripped. What I used to do, like to play in goal on the car park and stuff like that. But uh, as you say, them days are gone now. What about school itself? Uh, were you a good studier or not? Not all that well. As you say, I was like, the only lesson I always wanted to do is PE. That was about the only one. The other ones, I just went through the exams as well. Thingy, uh, as I, I was a dumb person, but uh, I'm not that dumb. Where did you sit in the class? Were you the kind of guy that sat at the back in a row four? Or? No, I liked to sit at the front, but out the way. Oh, <laughs> that's that's the can see you. That's it, yeah, they could see what I was doing, but they, you know, I wasn't doing it too well. I said uh, a lot of people have credited you with the discovery of Steve Bull and it's true that you were the first uh, man to really recognise his, his abilities I think. Yeah well I was put him in mind if I didn't shoot him really you know that was the idea that he did in the first place you know so at the time I don't think I was scouting for the Albion when he was 13 you know I was friends with Woodrow had been the Albion's chief scout you know but uh, so he used to body players from your team occasionally. But you saw, you saw Steve playing in a, in a little game over the back of your house I believe. Yeah there was a match on uh, the Willings of the Schools, see, and uh, I noticed him uh, beavering away, the smallest player on the pitch, playing up front, to get a goal pouch in the bullet thing, having shots at goal, wasn't scared to miss, you know, and I thought, well, I'll ask him to play me in two years time when the game's ended, if he'll come and have a game over Tipton's yet, you know. Got a good shot on him then, as well, as he yeah, on that? Yeah, he can hit the ball, although he's fairly, I think he's timing really with him, I think he's got good timing. Because he was physically a, a late developer, wasn't he? Oh, he was very small. Uh, even when uh, I had him in the youth team, he was, uh, he, although he started to grow, he still got no uh, strength in him. And he, very frail. He, he was getting taller. And, uh, but he could only score goals. A professional football career was a distant dream in July 1981 when Steve commenced work on a youth opportunity scheme with bed manufacturers Vono. From there he worked for two other local firms, Wilner Building Supplies and Dom Holdings, now Unifix. At the same time he was making a name for himself in amateur and Sunday league football. Alf, now you had uh, Steve Ball playing for you on a Sunday morning. Some people will probably find it difficult to believe that uh, Steve Ball was playing Sunday football but uh, you indeed had him there with your, your Sunday side. Yeah. What, what, uh, what made you want to sign him in the first place? Well, St Steve's exceptional pace was the, uh, the thing that first caught my eye with him. I mean, even now, I mean, people talk about his, his touch and that. I mean, I, I think people in general know that he ain't a great footballer as such. But um, his appetite for the game and uh, the sheer pace of the lad, you know. Now you, you used to go along and, and pick him up in the mornings to take, right. him, take him to play because he got no transport and that's he was right, yeah. nervous before the games, I gather. But he didn't always get a game, did he? Oh, no. No, sometimes he had to, uh, he had to take a back seat and... and, and What's from the sidelines, and, and and that's all part of uh, of being a footballer. You know, it's 
it ain't always roses as he, you know, he finds now. Now you're one of his, his biggest fans. You've always oh, sure. said that you think he's, he can do it at any level, yep. and, and he's but he can score he's, goals. That's right. Level. That's right. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I said, when he was in the even in the fourth division, and he was scoring goals regular, and people used to say the knockers in the game say, "Oh, but he will score at an higher level." And that. but when you've got the pace that he's, he's got, he, he, he'll score f for you know Wolves, England. Whoever, you know. Do you remember any particularly spectacular goals that he scored in, in Sunday morning football? Well, it's, that's difficult to question to ask really for because he, he basically he scored um, on average a goal a game for me. Yeah. So um, the, the only thing, the only one that springs to, to mind, I mean, um, it was a cup final when we played um, the four in hand, and we would lost to them the week before in the cup final. Yeah. When I told Steve. This is when the Albion at first said that they wasn't going to give him uh, uh, the contract. And Blackpool were apparently... Well, Blackpool was, was, was on his trail, but I'd got a Stoke City scout coming to the game, and I thought, well, I'll give Steve a bit of a boost and tell him, look, I've got somebody here to, you know, who's watching him. He had a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> we lost the cup. Yeah. Stoke City scout went away. The second week, we played him in a game, the same side, four in hand, the team who Brian Robson used to be a sales side when yeah. he was at the Albion. And um, we beat him 3 1, but he scored two cracking goals. No, he no, play, he no, played well the week before he could have signed for Stoke, yeah. but he was, as he was, he went to, to Albion. As he, as he was, the Albion changed the minds, and uh, I think that's all a bit of sense in the end. And, um, well, re rest speaks for himself, then. I took him in the first Monday of the Christmas, after the Christmas, and uh, told Number Stars, Number Stars asked me about him. I told him he couldn't play for Toffee. Why did you say that? Well, he hadn't got much uh, control, you know. And uh, nobody said, what's his good price? And uh, I said, well, he scores goals. And, uh, and he said, that'll do for me. Well, the local scout recommended him from a lad a chap called Sid Day. And he's the local scout for us, Brom. And he recommended this young striker. At, uh, but he was 19 years of age. And we thought he was a little old. But with Sid Day's recommendation, we brought him in training. And he used to come in and train at the night time. And that was with the 14-year-olds, and Steve was 19. So I showed that, I always thought I showed another character to come in and start training with the youngsters. And so then uh, we put him in the 18, for instance, he played in the 18. And every week he played in the 18 for me, he always scored one or two goals. But one of the big things was he, he missed goals. You know, he was always going to get chances in a game, 100% all the time. He, he used to wear defenders down, he'd never give them a miss. And I always thought, well, I was a defender. How would I have liked to play against him? And I, I thought that was the way I, I, I wouldn't. So anyway, he, he did well, he did quite well, and uh, I recommended to John Giles to sign him pro. And John said, well, we played in the reserves for a few while, uh, for a few games, and he played in the reserves for a few games, but he didn't do much. And I found out why, really, he hadn't been showing much in the reserves, but he was coming and training for me on a Thursday night, working, the next, and working on a shift the next night. Uh, and I know that the work he was doing was very hard, I forget what it was, but it was hard work, and he was working till the early hours of Saturday morning. Coming to play for me on the Saturday morning, we might travel from 8 o'clock or something over to Nottingham, play. I always scored one or two goals. Played in the afternoon for, for Tipton, and played on Sunday for the local side. And then on the Monday, he was back in work on a shift, and on a Tuesday night, he came to play for the reserves. He had no energy. So I said to John, well, I'd recommend a signing pro, and he says, what do you think? So I said, I think so. I would recommend signing pro, so he signed pro. And again, he started to score goals, he always scored goals. Despite impressive goal-scoring performances and occasional first-team appearances, Bull failed to persuade West Brom manager Ron Saunders of his merits, and Saunders subsequently transferred him to nearby struggling rivals, 4th Division Wolverhampton Rivers. I think it was a very big disappointment for Stevie, yeah. He, he, to say he was anything less was because as I said he's a Tipton boy and he, you know he, he'd been given the chance at West Brom and he, he used to love playing for them. Um, but I think uh, to be fair, I think it was the right thing for him. You know, people said I'm sure I'm sure West Brom would you now look back and say, well, we should have kept him and we, you know and about this and about that. But I think it was the right thing. I think Ronnie Saunders did the right thing for him because he wasn't really getting his chance there and. Uh, he went away and I think it gave him that much more belief in himself as well. And he was going to show everybody, which he has done. And I think, uh, it's, it's, you know, I think Ron Saunders was right for that. Obviously, for a team like Wolves, being steeped in the tradition and the history that they've got, playing in the fourth division must have been uh, 
a di- real disappointment. Well, it was because when I first went there, I to play Chorley, Chorley away at Bolton Ground, and I thought, oh, what have I come to here? You know, I mean, they lost one 0 and I thought, oh, what have what have I come to here? You know, I mean, and then the next three games we lost three 0 on the trot. I thought, yes, definitely, what have I done? Yes, I think the um, re-emergence of the club as a force in English football has gone hand in hand with, with Steve's achievement. Um, I think as a manager and as a coach, you get a lot of satisfaction seeing a boy that you take from uh, second division club's reserves and watch him develop into an international player. Um, there's some hard work gone into the development of Steve. We've, we've worked hard with his finishing, his first touch, things like that, but uh, uh, we've got to recognise how much the boys put into the game and how much he's improved himself um, and he's had a tremendous attitude to work he's wanted to, to get better he's wanted to prove people wrong at West Brom who were prepared to sell him uh, I think that's been one of the motivating forces behind his um, images uh, he's treated like a god now by, by the people on the South Bank and the John Island stand um, and he really has emerged as uh, I would say uh, the most professional player that I've ever worked with or played with in terms of his ability to do the job that he's paid to do and that is obviously to score goals and I've never come across anybody better at that job than, than, than Steve does it. That's towards Ball now, he's in with a chance and he's found the back of the net! Well, he's really... I was here when we signed Steve in November 86 and uh, the directors uh, put up the necessary cash to sign uh, Steve and Andy Thompson on the same day. That was a big risk at the time, wasn't it? Well, that's right. I mean, there wasn't a lot of money about. I mean, the club, right from since it started in 86, the new company has been completely self-financing. I mean, it doesn't have any arrangements for overdraft facilities. So all the money it generates through gate receipts, commercial income, etc., we have to plough back into the game uh, and use for buying players. Steve Bull proving to be one of Wall's better buys. Oh, tremendous. I mean, Steve has now, well, I mean, his value, you can't estimate uh, really what his true value is, but uh, for £64,000, a uh, tremendous investment. To steal to the byline, the cross comes in. Is not far away? Dennison. Bull with a header. Steve Bull came to us from West Bromwich Albion through uh, the activity of our chief scout, Ron Dukes, who'd watched him and considered that uh, he would be a good player, uh, uh, particularly as we were at that moment of time in the fourth division. So the co- a colleague of mine, myself, we, we agreed at that time to uh, sign Steve Bull. Um, the terms seemed right, apart from the, the fact that we did a cross deal with West Bromwich, which gives them part of the profits, which is a, but still that's the, I'm sure West Bromwich feel as, uh, as much sorrow about that as uh, we are, <coughs> in fact, over the moon about it. Well, Ron Duke says, Wolves Chief Scout, you were well aware of the abilities of Steve Bull, and at the time that Wolves were struggling and not scoring any goals, uh, he seemed a, a life target at West Bromwich Albion, is that right? Uh, yes, Steve was scoring goals in the in the Albion reserve side. Um, Albion reserves are uh, a side that uh, one is one frequently goes to watch, as does uh, as are all the other Midland reserve sides. Um, the Central League is a, is, a, is a reasonable recruiting ground, particularly when when Wolves at that time were, were in the fourth division, uh, and um, I, I felt in the Albion reserve side there were several players who who uh, could move uh, and do well in the fourth or third divisions. One isn't able to say that they're going to go right the way through as some of them have done ultimately. 
Um, and Bo was a lad who'd come to Albion from Tipton, um, had certainly improved in the 12 months uh, since I'd seen him play for Tipton, um, and uh, was, was consistently scoring goals and consistently uh, causing himself a nuisance to the defence because he was perpetually on the go. Uh, mobility and, uh, and, and enthusiasm were the hallmarks that one, one saw in him. Were you surprised then that uh, a young goal scorer like that was released by Ron Saunders? Um, well, uh, I can't look into Ron Saunders' mind. I don't know what 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 he what his program was. He he got a number of strikers in the result at that particular time. Of people like Verardi and Cooks who were not getting regular games in the first team. Um, you can only play X number of players in your first team. You make your assessment, and he made the assessment that. Uh, Although he'd given Bull a game or so in the in the in the first team and he, he had actually scored, um, it wasn't for him. Were you reluctant or, or cautious, perhaps, uh, the price that was quoted by West Bromwich Albion? Well, the prices have nothing to do with me. The idea, uh, I think, somebody can play or somebody can't play, and it's for the manager and the board to decide whether the price is uh, right too high or what. Um, with hindsight, everyone would say it's not very much. At the time, 50,000 was a was a big fee for Wolves. Um, and uh, we, we subsequently went back and bought um, uh, two other players from Melbourne in, in, in a very short space of time. In fact, we bought one the same day as, um, uh, as Wolves. Andy, um, Andy Thompson. And, and both of them were very, very speedy transfers. Andy, you, perhaps better than anybody else at Molyneux, know Steve Ball because you were with him at West Bromwich Albion. When he came to, to West Brom as a raw, non-league player, how did the, the rest of the professionals at, uh, at the Hawthorns view him? Um, well, first of all, he came on trial to start with before he ever signed professional, and he was like um, doing well in the reserves, knocking a few goals in, and um, I think that's what got him the contract at the club, but he was um, doing well scoring in the reserves. Were you surprised that West Brom were prepared to, to let somebody who was scoring goals go and who had a potential and was young to, to another club? Um, I was very surprised. Like I was waiting in the offices of the Albion when Steve came in because they told me I was travelling down with somebody else for the morning. I was very surprised to let him go because the amount of goals he had scored for the second team. And he scored, I think it was three and five games for the first team when he played then. So I was very surprised that they let him go. Now, what was the story around the two of you moving? Because it happened very, very quickly, didn't it? Uh, well, I just went in for training on the one morning, and like one of the trainers says to me, um, the manager wants to see you down the ground, so I travelled down to the ground. He says, um, Wolves come in for you, they made an offer, and we've agreed, give them talk terms. And I was about to set off, and then they says, wait a minute, there's somebody else coming down here. <laughs> and then, somebody else yeah, was Steve. Yeah, Steve coming to the office. And you developed a, a great friendship with him from that time, didn't you? Yeah, no, well, we travelled down together, like, cause Steve had the car, and we travelled down, and it's just gone from there, because, like, we come together. And you came into a fourth division setup here, a uh, pretty poor ground after the Hawthorns, which is a, a beautiful setup. You must have uh, wondered whether you were making the right decision, perhaps? Um, it did get through my mind after I made the decision, like, because um, we just played Chorley, and we just lost 3 0 when I did sign, but from then we've done well, we've battled hard, and we've come up. Now, when you came, Steve went in first to see the manager, I believe, and he, Graham Turner, Turner says, was the fastest signing he's ever made until he signed you. Yeah, uh, well, he says um, whatever it um, looks a good setup like, and he says like they're building for the future now. So we went in and like talked to uh, the manager, and what he offered us, uh, we liked, so he signed. Steve, in his period with us, has been the makings of the club really. If one takes into account his goals, that's the reason we won the. At the fourth division, the reason we won the third division. He's a tremendous character. I've dealt with him and his contracts over the last two years. He's uh, been in to see me on both occasions, particularly recently on his trip back from Italy. But it's been a pleasure to do with uh, the chap. I mean, the two interviews to, to uh, fix his salary have taken 15 minutes at the most. Uh, we've had no cause to disagree and uh, anything he's asked for, not we've given him, but we've edged a little bit each way and he's, he said, yes, I never want to leave this club. And I take the view that if he never wants to leave this club, he won't leave this club.
There's a peculiar tradition here at Wolves which involves all the players training on the club's car park. What's the history behind this? Yes, this is uh, a tradition. The manager started a, a few uh, seasons ago um, where they used to have a little five-a-side on the car parks and I think the following day when we played the game had a tremendous result and they've done it ever since and the players seem to enjoy it. They have a little bit of uh, uh, a competition. There's a yellow jersey which uh, is awarded to the worst performance of the morning on the car park and that causes a little interest between the players and I think it, it gives a good spirit for the players prior to, to the game on Saturday and they seem to really enjoy it. Has Steve ever been awarded the yellow jersey? Well, I believe he's had it once or twice without, without doubt. Um, uh, there have been mornings when he's looked abysmal and uh, he's tried his hand at playing at the back at times and uh, uh, but yes he's, he's, he's had things like that. His toughness is, is built around wanting to score goals. It's as simple as that. I don't think he's a dirty player um, but when he gets a sight of goal and the ball is around about him uh, nothing stands in his way or he doesn't want anything to stand in his way and uh, he's prepared to knock defenders uh, sideways if necessary to get a strike at goal and I think that is um, few of that sort of image of uh, a bull type player um, but I think that he's also taken a lot of stick from defenders and at times intimidation and unfortunately on two or three occasions he's reacting to that intimidation um, but I think that having been sent off a couple of times uh, he's learned from that and I see him now keeping a cool ahead uh, prepared to take the intimidation and the hard tackling and get up and get on it and it would be fair to say he certainly gives as good as he gets out there I was very, very, very involved in I mean, I'd snap at anything, I'd have a swing, I'd have a kick, I'd, have, you know, I'd do anything to stop the defender and stop pulling me. But now I think myself, I'll just turn around and I'll look at him and I'll laugh at him. And I'll put the ball in the back of the net and that hurts him more. And it's far more pleasurable for you than getting the other Yeah, I'm punching him to yeah. and saying, oh, God, I've sent off again, like, you know what I mean? Mm. How much do you have to concentrate during a game? How, how often can you have a lapse of concentration? Or kind of well, you have, to, you have to put your shirt on and that's it. Forget everything, the radio is off, everything, nobody's talking to you, whatever, you just have to go on that pitch for 90 minutes and concentrate all on the game. Forget the fans, forget the television, forget everything. But the only person in the upper tier of the Waterloo Road stand is the Wolves manager, Grant Turner. And that drops the ball, fires one, 1-0! One well, they'll be delighted, that's put Wolves ahead. Turn from Denison. That's a beautiful ball in for much laser for ball. 4 0. Leicester full back. That's a great ball through. Steele now. Ball in again. Can he get his hat trick? He can. 3 0. Three goals for ball. 5 0 to Wolves. Taylor allowed space to chest it down. It wasn't a good, good layoff from him, but uh, certainly allowed a little too much space. And Dennis neatly through for Bellamy. Wolves away on this letter now. With a run on goal, fires it 2 0. Well, he can't allow that sort of space to Steve Ball. His finishing is absolutely lethal, and you really can't afford to let him get that sort of space behind the defence. Now, Steele, it's a good cross to the far post. Ball's there 3 0. will chase after this. Gets there ahead of Rennie, gets away from him. Fires one in, straight through the keeper's legs. Oh, poor Ronnie Sinclair. Would you believe it? Well, you have to feel sorry for Ronnie Sinclair there in the city goal. Obviously, being the goal scorer that you are, you attract a lot of attention, press attention as well. Do you buy every single newspaper available and sit and read them? I usually buy, but uh, as I say, the girlfriend don't like the press. No, well, I don't like the press actually, but uh, as I say, we buy the papers just to see whether they've been to the match or not. But uh, some reports, they're not even at our game, I don't think so. Do you sometimes read them and think, well, he must have been at a different game to me? Well, it is, it's, a, it's, it's not in your case, but uh, in my case, playing football, you read the paper, you think, oh, it's, it's a lot of rubbish sometimes. Does that affect you at all, though, if you get up and you think you've had a game and somebody says, oh, Steve Ball was rubbish yesterday? Well, he does. They say, oh, I wake up and I think, oh, I, I, had a, I had a decent game. I worked hard, but I worked hard. And they said the papers all booted out, should be out and all this. But uh, as you say, some of them don't even got the game, but I don't think so. Well, Paul Stancliffe, obviously you've seen Bully at the time.
And from both ends of the pitch, because you've been a defender against him for Sheffield United and now a teammate of his at uh, Wolves. What is it, from a defender's point of view, that makes him such a difficult player to handle? I think his, his ability really just to, to unsettle defenders. He's not frightened of running at them or running past them. He'll always shoot, he's not frightened of missing. And you, you look through the, the years and that's always been a, sort of a great goal scorer's attribute. He seems like a, a very physical player. Does he knock defenders around? He does, yeah, but I, I always enjoyed playing against him because he was always an honest lad. He wasn't sort of give you an elbow on the sly or kick you on the sly. You know, it, whatever he did was truly honest and it, it was sort of sent forward he enjoyed playing against. Now, as a, a man who played for his local sides in Rotherham and, and Sheffield, you understand the uh, the fans having a certain uh, empathy with him because of him being a local lad here in Wolverhampton. Oh, definitely. I mean, he's done he's done tremendously well. It gives the lads uh, on the cop something to cheer about. You know, they can sort of relate to somebody like that because, like you say, he's come up as a local lad. You know, there's probably a few on there that went to school with him. They, they know him, known him years, so they always like something to cheer on like that. Bishop is released. Much. He finds it through the ball. Trilly, two now. Well, that's a disaster by Ian Bishop. Absolute suicide. Steve, I think it's fair to say that uh, certainly at Wolves, you're what might be classed as a local hero, aren't you? The fans are certainly have taken to you. Well, the fans love him because they uh, score goals and uh, they enjoy coming down and playing every week and just, just seeing goals and seeing him win. We've got ambitions and I think that's one of the reasons why the loyalty of Steve has been um, uh, quite outstanding. He's always been prepared to uh, commit his future to, to the club and I believe it's because both he and the club have shared the same ambitions and that is to become, in his case, a, a first division player and in the club's case, a, a force in the first division. Um, it's been proved that you don't have to be in there to get international recognition, uh, but the sooner we get there, the better. And I'm certainly thrilled that uh, seasons in the first division will yet again improve, Steve. Header away from Andy Ritchie, neatly brought down by Cook and volleys it up in one motion ball. Surely, 1 0, it's there! Steve Ball! Well, Wolves have started positively and really should have gone 1 0 ahead from Andy Mutch just a moment earlier. And Wolves are really enjoying themselves this afternoon. Ball is in, 2 1! I think one of the big things about Steve is his honesty, and I think it shows to people. It shows his guts and his character. You know, and as I say, people who always kept going on about his first touch and his this and that. And nobody plays at international level as he's played and coming through the divisions and keeps scoring the goals like he does. Uh, if you're, you're not a good player, he's a very good player. And as I said, and bad, bad thing. And I think, you know, his, his name probably typifies it. But the like that bull looks good. Um, Winning them against the wall or whatever, that's when they come out with the supporters to work back for them. And I think they identify with Steve. He's always, he's always gonna, he's always gonna be there. He's always gonna be working hard for you. He's always gonna be there. And if there's half a chance, more often than not, Steve will have done that. But here we are, Albert. Uh, just before Wolves fans set off for yet another away trip, and to see their hero in action, hopefully uh, scoring goals at Ashton Gate. Bully is an absolute hero to the, to the Wolves fans and has really almost single-handedly helped to rebuild this club, hasn't it? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. I think we were sceptics in the early days and you had people in my ilk saying, well, he, he's not as good as the old school, but I mean, in fairness, we got a bow to the lad. He's put Wolverhampton back on the map, the team. Everything so far, uh, you can't praise the lad enough. He's done wonders for the club and he's most certainly the hero of the day. The Wolves fans love him as, as a, almost as a god, really, and it's something that you can actually uh, build on. You can use the, the Steve Ball image uh, to, to carry along uh, projects for the, for the supporters, and I think particularly of the trip to Newcastle. Well, that was a wonderful event. I mean, it was very, very, very difficult at the time, but uh, Steve, as though somebody waved a magic wand both in both directions, I think he took something out of the crowd that day. And we certainly took something out of Steve, and uh, as you say, it was script written really, it was a mag magnificent day, and, and he couldn't have done more, and it was down to a sole man in that particular instant to, to put four goals away, it was incredible.
But what a boy, what, what a player, and I mean, he'll be a legend in his own right now, and, and, and rightly so. When you go out there and play 90 minutes and you don't score a goal, do you think necessarily then you've had a bad game or not? Well, I'm, I'm usually a bit moody after the game, I haven't scored like, but uh, not otherwise, I say, as long as the team wins and they say the ball is in the pay, wage packet, that's all that matters. <laughs> uh, what, how does scoring goals affect uh, life outside? If you're moody for half an hour after a game, does that spill over into Saturday night? And well, not really, as I say, I've, I have uh, two hours coming back on the couch, if we're away match and we lose, I sit there and I come back and she, she, she smiles at me and goes, are you OK, or are you all right, or whatever. And I say, yeah, it's all right, and it's all gone now. But uh, after I come back in the air, it's usually gone. What are those long coach trips like from away games when you come back, depending on whether you've won or lost? We have a game of cards and relax and have a, have a drink on the way back, and it's relaxing, really. If you've had a bad game, will the teams just and take the game apart and, and say it was your fault for letting that one in? <laughs> well, we do, but we don't blame each other. We, we, we look over our mistakes and think, oh, we should have done that, we should have done this. But uh, we never blame each other. It's a team, it's a team game. On the side of being a team game, being a scorer up front, how important is it for you, for the players around you to be playing well? Well, they've got to be there because uh, on, the, on the goal get out the same as Andy Much now, um, but uh, that we have got to have the ball, the supply of the balls to put the ball in it, but uh, it's on our own backs as well to do a lot of contribution to the other team as well to get there. Andy, they say that all good striking uh, partnerships are pairs and very much it's a, a case of Steve Bull and Andy Much that have worked together to bring Wolves from the fourth division into the second division. Did you ever have any inkling when you first made that partnership how successful it would be? Not really, no. I think at the, at, at the time, you know, we just got thrown together, you know, and uh, Steve came from West Brom, you know, he wasn't really very re recognised then and uh, since he's been at the club, you know, we've worked all together and uh, we have formed a, a reasonably good partnership together, really, and uh, I think obviously Steve's uh, in the forefront, obviously being at the international level, but I think we'd have a good partnership together, but obviously at the time we didn't really foresee that. You've, you've had to work together, I mean, in times when you did and he's not played so well, people do feel that you do contribute quite a lot to, to his game, but what's he like to play alongside? Well, he's very easy to play up front with, to be quite honest, because he's very hard working and honest, you know. You know, if there's a ball played down the line, he'll be the first to run to it, you know, and vice versa. We both work hard for each other. We, uh, we talk a lot together, you know, before we go out, you know, and we conscientiously want to do well for each other and, you know, try and create goals for each other. And I think if you've got that, you're halfway there, you know. He does score an incredible number of goals from the games he's played. What do you put that down to? Well, he's very strong and determined. Like, you know, every game he plays, you know, he wants to score goals. He's, he's very hungry to score goals. And, and obviously, he's got a very good strike and he's got great pace and, uh, and strength. And if there's a, you know, sometimes a 60 40 ball, you know, he's always strong enough to get there. He's had criticism from people who say that his first touch isn't good and that uh, he'll never play well at the very top level. But you've played very close to him. Do you think he's got the ability to do it at any level? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt, you know, I mean, if Steve played for his top first division club tomorrow, I'd have a, he'd be a top, amongst the top first division scorers. There'd be no doubt in my mind that that'd be the case, you know, but they've mentioned about his first touch a few years ago, but that tends to stick a bit. I think what happens is uh, they said he didn't have a good touch, which he may not have when he first came to the club, but he's, been, he's improving all the time, you know, as a player, and I don't think he'd be in the international, international squad if he couldn't control the ball. Simple as that. Um, what do you actually get up to? There's this traditional picture we have of football playing golf or fishing. Well, at the moment, as I say, there's, there's not a lot I can do. As I say, I'm, I'm either doing presentations, signing autographs, doing things like this. But uh, I like again golf and a, a, a swim now and again. It's nice and relaxing. What about the golf? How good is it or bad? Bad. <laughs> it's very horrible. Yeah, I just, I just line the balls up and just whack them and just let them go anywhere I want. Is that relaxing though as well? Does that is that one point where you can forget about the football? It is because you're out in there, you know, you know, on a three mile course and nobody can bother you, just hit the balls and just have a bit of fresh air and just get out there and take no notice of anybody. And I suppose it's excess that doesn't involve running around a football pitch. Well, it, well um, I'm usually running, I'm running after my ball. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the other golfers aren't. But uh, it, is, it is relaxing. On the fitness front, being a, a striker, that has obviously got to be one of the positions where if you are slightly unfit, people are going to notice. Well, they do, they do because you've got to run there, there, run back as far as all of those. 
Uh, I usually try to keep myself fit. I say it's, it's only the injuries and the knocks that knock you back a bit. But uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm quite fit. Well, how do you go about the fitness? Do you do fitness outside of the club? or? Well, we've got exercise like upstairs. I usually, right. usually get on that now and again. But uh, don't do all that much. Don't do all that much. What about fitness related to eating? Do you have to be careful what you eat or not? No, I'll just eat what I want. Eat and drink what I want and eat. I'll just get it off the next morning. It's quite envious. What's your favourite dishes then? Are you? Favourite dishes? Oh, yeah. Double cheese, eggs and chips, I think, from McDonald's. <laughs> it's, it's stuff like that. I eat a lot of junk food and a lot of sweets. I don't, it's a wonder I don't put loads of weight on, but it just suddenly comes off. They ever say at the club, oh, three burgers too many <laughs> this week? Or? <laughs> no, they, they don't know what I eat. They only know what we have for pre match and they have noise. Steak, egg and beans, something like that, pretty much, or cheese omelette. Is that still the traditional pre match meal, a steak, is that? That, that is the pre match meal. Well, well, all I have now is cheese omelette, beans, and toast, and a nice cup of tea. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm ready, for, ready to go then. What time do you usually get to the ground before a Saturday game? We usually get there about quarters to ten to two. Have a sit down, and say, read the, read the programme, look, go and look at the pitch, and then uh, get back and get, get ready. What about a midweek game, depending on whether you're home or away? Midweek game, we say, oh, we train in the morning, have a little circle and a few spins. I'll come back and I say, I have a, a bit of soup or something for dinner, and then I've, I've missed egg, egg and egg and beans, and then I'm off there. Mm. What about away games midweek? Are they tiring? Because it's obviously, <laughs> depending on the distance, uh, you could be travelling for three or four hours before you get there. Yeah, they, they are tiring, so it takes a lot of yeah, That's why. You, if you're a good uh, say manager and trainer, they get you there early enough so you can have a rest or sleep in the afternoon, so you can relax and then get up and then ready, refreshing for the game. Right, no. but then again, come quarter to ten and you've got to set back on the road. Well, I see you there again, oh, here we go again, what you mean? But as long as you tell me you don't mind, it's just travelling there and getting the game over with. And then when on the way back, you just you just relax and that's it, then it's gone. What about the next day? Do they give you some time off? They, they, we usually have a, a day off a week, so the manager's generous to us, I think. You know, we have a Wednesday off after a midweek game, or even if we haven't got a midweek game. We run hard Tuesday, have a good breath, blow, like, clear the lungs, and then we have Wednesday off. What makes a good referee? Do, do referees come in and have a good lengthy chat with you before the game? Or? Not really. They check the studs, check your rings, check your necklaces, whatever, and all that. And uh, they just say, no swearing, 10 yards away from the ball, and I'll just let the play go on. But isn't that a kind of set menu that they're going to say to every team before every game? Would it be any easier if referees came in and had a chat? Or? Well, it would, but if, if they did that, I think they'd get accused of getting too, you know, getting too close to the players and allowing, you know, allowing them to carry on with it. Dirty fouls and stuff like that. But uh, I think the referee should just keep well away from the players and just do their job and read them But isn't that one of the problems that the referees are being accused of not understanding the players? Well, it is, but uh, they're referees, we're players. Uh, ours is a totally different game to going out there and playing, and theirs is totally different to going out there and doing uh, judgments on us. Referees and players, one side. Uh, obviously, it's a long way off, but uh, could you ever see yourself as Steve Ball, the manager? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think I'm uh, strong enough and hard enough for the manager's job. I don't think I'd like to go to so I'd, something like coaching or something, or even they say something else outside football. Mm. TV commentator. Not the way I talk. <laughs> no, not the way I talk. No. <laughs> well, what about uh, management though? Is it uh, is it tough to manage them? Or is it what about management though? Is it is it something that looks simpler than it is? Or it looks easy. Yeah, but there's a there's a lot of uh, stress and hard work in behind that. Yeah, I mean behind a happy face. Mm. You often see a lot of unhappy faces in football management. Quite a few. Quite a few. They, we we usually get the backlash a couple of times. What happens if the, the game's just gone really badly and you've lost 3-0? Um, do you just have to sit there and think, oh, well, it's going to come, so I've got to take it? And well, that's it. They say, you know whether you've had a bad game. You know. You know. I'd, I'd want the manager to pull me in and say, look, you, you've, you've had a bad game. You, you want to improve on this, improve on that. But uh, they've got to keep the distance as well, and they know how to, how to, how to plan the game out. Well, I think the pleasing thing about his um, rise to international football is that the line himself has never changed. His attitude to work, his attitude to his teammates and in the dressing room has never changed one little bit. And uh, uh, I think that's, that's very pleasing. 
he still gets the same sort of rollicking that, uh, that other players will get from time to time. Um, the other players take the mickey out of him just as much as he takes the mickey out of uh, his teammates. So it's been, it's been good for the dressing room that the star of the side has never been treated any differently and never wanted to be treated any differently. Um, and I think that helps in team spirit, in morale in the dressing room. Uh, and they obviously see his contribution to the team and, and they share in the success that he's had. I can recall his, uh, his run on the pitch at, against the Scots and I frankly felt a lump in my throat. I thought, felt I was part of it and uh, I was proud to be that way. And on comes Steve Ball for his first cap. And he's only the fifth player to appear from the third division. I mean, his very first international, I think it was his first international against Scotland. I mean, three shots and the keepers had to, the keepers had to make two saves and he scored a good one. Um, that's the way he always is. But a great strength about him is if he misses a chance, it, it doesn't get him down. And that takes him down. Ten minutes remaining. Ball. And again! Oh! Right in the corner. What a start. Scoring on his debut. The man from the third division and Wolves, or they're about to lead there. Scores on his first appearance at senior level. I for goal again. No hesitation. Bang. The cross in here, and as he goes up with McPherson, look, it hits his back, and he's already turning because he knows where it's going to drop, and he finishes superbly. And uh, really, it's dictated. So, speaking on behalf of the fans, there is this pent up feeling inside. Steve, we love you. We want you to stay. But uh, we hope sincerely that it doesn't now affect his England. And I think in the back of his mind, his England place, he's thought, well, if Wolves sort of totter now at the back end of this season, where is it going to put him? And we sincerely hope and believe that uh, the fact that he's staying loyal to Wolves will not affect his chances with the England squad. He's already Wolves' second highest goal scorer behind John Richards. And he's made inroads into the England side. Can he score those sort of goals at international level, which is a, a different type of football? There again, I haven't got a crystal ball, I can't answer that. One can only say that if he's given the opportunity, he'll prove whether he can or whether he can't. And do you think he will get that opportunity? Because the problem is that the style of his play is not that sophisticated, is it? Um, when you come to sophistication and so on and so forth, the only thing that wins matches is the ball in the back of the net. Now, if someone decides that they're going to give him the opportunity to see whether he can do it, he'll take that opportunity and do it, or he'll take an opportunity and fail. And that's what he's done all the way along the line. Up to now, it's been one long string of success. I don't think he's had entirely a fair, uh, a fair crack of the whip in his uh, service to him. He hasn't, he hasn't, to me, he doesn't seem to have had the right sort of service um, okay uh, Taylor picks the England team and I think I, I still think he'll stay with Bully and I, I frankly think that he's, he can still do a, a, a good job for England We've had a change in manager during the, uh, his brief career in international football. Uh, I believe that Graham Taylor thinks quite highly of him, regards him um, as, a, as a good member of the squad. Uh, it's up to Steve if he can get an opportunity again to make sure that he takes it. I believe that the criticism of him has been very unfair and the pressure heaped upon him before the Poland match um, was almost unbearable. Uh, he was the golden boy during the summer just prior to the... To the um, to the World Cup, everybody was championing his course to become a, a regular in the England side. Um, but unfortunately, having got there, then the press and the media in general just just turned against him. And he's uh, when you get people like Sir Alf Ramsey being very critical and feeling that he shouldn't be a member of the England team, then I think sooner or later it's got to got to affect the boy. And I watched the game against Poland very closely, and I felt that he didn't do himself justice in the game. Uh, he looked a little bit uptight. Uh, which is to be expected with the amount of pressure that had been heaped upon him. Um, but I believe that he will emerge as, uh, as a very good first division player with this club 
um, and further claims for a place in the England side, a permanent place in the England side. People talked about the partnership with Gary Lineker not being a successful partnership. Um, one wonders how long Gary will go on playing for England, uh, although he's doing an excellent job at the moment, and I wouldn't dispute that. Uh, I feel Steve has got the um, the potential, the ability to ultimately replace Gary Lineker in the England team. How tired and weary are you at an end of the season, and then when you know you've got to go off to, to the World Cup, does it does it actually revitalise you at all, or do you feel even more tired? No, well, in a, in a sense, it, it gives you a buzz inside your, inside your body, as though you've got to feel as though you're going to the World Cup. But at the end of the season, your legs are tired, your head's tired, and you just want to get back home, you know, and have a couple of weeks off and eat and drink as much as you can. But uh, I never had the chance this summer, as I went to Italy, and uh, it went okay. What was Italy like? How did you find the locals out there? It was all right. I say, you, as you say, you see in the papers a bit these discos we went to and everything. But there was no life there at all. As I say, we could never go, never do anything. It was just we was there for a job, and that was it. Was that a shame at all? Because if I'd been spending four weeks in a foreign country, I would have thought, well, I could have seen a few of the sights. Well, you could have been, you could have done, but uh, we got out now and again. We had a game golf, stuff like that, swim. You know what I mean, sunbathe. But uh, it was more restricted to the hotel per perimeter. What kind of food did they give you out there? Did you sell the traditional stuff, or was it? It was just you? everything they put down for you. You know, you could eat what you want, but on the day, matter of the day or the day before the match, they set a meal out for you. But before that, you could eat and drink as much as you want. What about the weather? How was it? It looked good from here. It was too hot. Too yeah. hot. They say we got a nice tan out there, but they say we were climatised to the weather as well. And was was quite fit in that conditions. World Cup itself. Um, I think it's fair to say, certainly the final was a great disappointment to, to most people that watched it. Uh, there was a lot of playing to the cameras out there. How, how were you out there? What did you hear from back home when you were out there? Well, I, I didn't hear much. I say all, all, all I was going to say, all the people are cheering for it and everything, helping England do well and all that. But uh, as far as the team went, I think the team went extremely well. I said we were unlucky. If we had a bit more luck, and uh, you know, he scored another goal against Germany. We'd have got to the final. I think we'd have won the final. Mm -hmm. But uh, the final itself, you say, disappointing. Argentina, disappointing team. But uh, never mind. It might be the next two years. Ball trying to get round him. Foster slips. Now he's got a chance to go past him. Not balls of greatest strength, but he fires one. And what a great goal! Oh, just a measure of the man. He looked to have no opportunity found the space around Steve Foster and as he was falling, Ball fired the shot in. Playing for Wolves, coming up through the fourth and then the third and the second, now in the second division, um, it, it hasn't looked that difficult. An outsider's point of view, it looks as though, you know, the team's played well and, and that's been, you know, the end of it. Well, it does, but uh, this is this is uh, the season we start off the best out of the four of them and uh, we usually sl start slow and then pick up towards the end where we... Uh, where we don't even get nowhere, but uh, we we're starting well this season. Not touch what I hope we can get out of the second division this year. How important is it for you personally to play first division football? Well, I think I've had four or four divisions, four seasons with the uh, Wolves now, and uh, I'm due one season in the first division at least. So I just hope it's next year. Let's hope it's more than one as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. I say once we're up there, I'm going to try and keep, try and keep them up there. Cook curls it through, balls there, fires it first time and finds the back of the net. Looked up, looked at the goal, picked his spot, didn't bother controlling it, just hit it in the back of the net, it's that simple. You come across as a very kind of ordinary chap, with no great airs or graces. How do people outside see you? Do you have still friends from, say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago that you meet up with, and they say, oh, I can't talk to you now, you're a famous footballer? Well, they do. They, I do meet up with them now and again as, I, as much as I can. But uh, when I meet up with them, they're still the same. They, they still respect me as the same same person, the same player. Do they talk to you differently at all? No, yeah, they're still the same. They still say, "Do you want a point?" <laughs> that's about all. <laughs> that's a good start. That's point, it. Yeah. <laughs> they're embarrassed to say anything, or you know, they don't want to come and speak to me. But they're all, they're okay. Do you find that people, if they come and talk to you, only want to talk about football, or think that you only want to talk about? Well, they do. As I say, when I, when I go out for a presentation, whatever, I want to shut off. But if, with your friends, you know, you, you've got to keep talking and talking and talking over the same things again. Well, I've said it, you know, into you, you're locked in and on and on and on. But you, you have to, you have to talk about it, and they're your friends, so you have to keep in with them. 
Do you ever try and change the conversation a bit and bring in something that you want to talk about? Is there something to. good you've seen on telly last night? Or I try to, as I say, but uh, as I say, they just over overall it. You know, I mean, they go back straight onto football again. But uh, you can't do it early. Dennison with the corner, flicked on by Thompson. Ball, Stevie Ball's done it. Outside of football, um, you've got two dogs here at the house. They're quite a handful, aren't they? Two tethers. Yeah. Yeah. They are the good dogs, they say. They keep the girlfriend company, me and myself company. But they, they're good lads, they say. They, they break us up, really. They say we, we take them for walks over the mountain down and have a good, they say, keeps them fit as well. They look pretty vicious chaps. I mean, one of what the bigger one is apparently the friendlier one. Yeah, yeah King King and Sam, like uh, King's the big one, and uh, he's the one that usually looks after Sam, but Sam's bossing him about now, but uh, they are they are a handful. But Sam's not not very old, and already <laughs> looks as though yeah. he's going to... Well, he's going to be a giant, he's, he's, he's 14 weeks old now, but... Uh, they're not ferocious at the moment, they say, if I go to eat the girlfriend or whatever, they'll, they'll go for me, you know what I mean? They'll have me straight over, no trouble. What about taking him out for exercise? Is that full time occupation? It's, it's like that, you know, two two dogs and two legs, you, your arms are out and everything, you come back, your arms are bigger than you what they should be, but that all right. Good company as well for your girlfriend. Very good as I I go on the England trips and I go on, you know, in the wolf trips and everything. And as I say she she's got somebody to shout at. <laughs> <laughs> well she shout at you when you're home then? Or well, a few <laughs> times. <laughs> But uh, obviously Gary, being away a lot of the time with Wolves and England, um, does that make you appreciate being home even more? Well it does, it, it, it makes me appreciate how much you need a girlfriend and how much you need somebody to come home to. They say you come into an empty house, it's, it's, it's not nice. They say now you've got a girlfriend in this, it's, it's great. But then again, I bet she has to be on the receiving end of all the uh, swearing and the bad language when you're getting after losing. Or? She does actually say, I'll come back and she, she looks at me and says, go on then, have you say like whatever, <laughs> stuff like that, we, we just get it over with. What happens Saturday nights when you're at home? What time do you get away from the club? Uh, I get away from the club about 6 o'clock, half past 6, and I get in here about quarter to 7, something like that. I fetch uh, the Argus and the Sporting Star, read the paper, and say we get a video in and you'd have a, a, a bottle of wine down again. Mm. Do you go out a lot on Saturday nights? Or you not all that much. We, we, we can't, you say, we, we've got no privacy at, at all. We can't just go out to the local and say hello, you know, we have a, have a couple of pints or whatever. We can't do that. They say it's invaded our privacy altogether. Does that bother you? Or? It, it doesn't bother me so much, you say, it's a girlfriend to say, when we're out there together, when you're eating a meal or whatever, you go for a meal and somebody goes, can you sign this for me, show it up your nose or whatever, you know, anything. Can't you just leave us alone, just to have a meal or something, be quiet. But at the end of the day, I suppose it's part and parcel of well, that's, being that's, a football. Well, that's, 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 as you say, as you say it's, it's a price of fame. Right. But it's quite nice, therefore, I suppose, staying in is probably more pleasurable than going out to, well, it is actually, to a pub. it is actually, shut the curtain, shut yeah. the doors, lock everybody out, you know, you put the telly on and have a nice talk and a chat and sit down in front of the fire. And then wait for the Sunday papers. That's it, yeah. <laughs> That's what that put in. Yeah. Now, well, in a, in a sense, it, it gives you a buzz inside your, inside your body, as though you've got a feeling, as though you're going to the World Cup. But at the end of the season, your legs are tired, your head's tired, and you, you just want to get back home, you know, and have a couple of weeks off and eat and drink as much as you can. But uh, I never had the chance this summer, as I went to Italy, and uh, it went okay. What was Italy like? How did you find the locals out there? It was all right, as, I, you, as you say, you see in the papers a bit, these discos we went to and everything. But, there was no life there at all. As I say, we could never go out, never do anything. It was just, we was there for a job and that was it. Was that a shame at all? Because if I'd been spending four weeks in a foreign country, I would have thought, well, I've got to see a few of the sites. Well, you could have been, you could have done, but uh, we got out now and again. We had a game golf, stuff like that, swim, you know what I mean, sunbathe, but uh, we was more restricted to the hotel per, per perimeter. What kind of food did they give you out there? Did you solve the traditional stuff or was it... It was just everything they put down for you. You know, you could eat what you want, but on the match of the day or the day before the match, they set a meal out for you. But before that, you could eat and drink as much as you want. What about the weather? How was it? It looked good from here. <laughs> it was too hot. Too yeah. hot. They say, we got a nice tan out there, but they say, we were climatised to the weather as well, and we was, we was quite fit in that conditions. World Cup itself, um, I think it's fair to say, certainly the final was a great disappointment to, to most people that watched it. Uh, there was a lot of playing to the cameras out there. How, how were you out there? What did you hear from back home when you were out there? Well, I, I didn't hear much. I say all, all, all I was in, say all the people are cheering for it and everything, helping England do well and all that. But uh, as far as the team went, I think the team went extremely well. As I was unlucky, if we had a bit more luck, and uh, you know, he scored another goal against Germany. We'd have got to the final. I think we'd have won the final. Mm -hmm. But uh, the final itself, you say, disappointing. Argentina, disappointing team. But uh, never mind. It might be the next two years. Ball trying to get round him. Foster slips. Now he's got a chance to go past him. Not Ball's the greatest strength, but he finds one. And what a great goal! Oh, just a measure of the man. He 
who looked to have no opportunity found the space around Steve Foster and as he was falling Bull fired the shot in Playing for Wolves coming up through the fourth and then the third and the second now in the second division um, it, it hasn't looked that difficult from an outsider's point of view it looks as though you know the team's played well and, and that's been you know the end of it well it does but uh, this is this is a uh, season we start off the best out of the four of them and uh, we usually sl start slow and then pick up towards the end where we uh, where we don't even get nowhere. But uh, we, we're starting well this season, not touch what I hope we can get out of the second division this year. How important is it for you personally to play first division football? Well, I think I've had four four divisions, four seasons with the uh, Wolves now, and uh, I'm due one season in the first division at least, so I just hope it's next year. Let's hope it's more than one as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. I say once we're up there, I'm going to try, try and keep them up there. Cook curls it through, balls there, fires it first time and finds the back of the net. Looked up, looked at the goal, picked his spot, didn't bother controlling it, just hit it in the back of the net, it's that simple. You come across as a very kind of ordinary chap, no great airs or graces. How do people outside see you? Do you have still friends from, say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago that you meet up with? And they say, oh, I can't talk to you now, you're a famous footballer. Well, they do. They, I do meet up with them now and again as, I, as much as I can. But uh, when I meet up with them, they're still the same. They, they still respect me as the same same person, the same player. Do they talk to you differently at all? No, they're that? still the same. They still say, do you want a point? <laughs> <laughs> that's about all <laughs> they good start and point. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yes. They're too embarrassed to say anything. They don't to come and speak to me. But they're, all, they're okay. Do you find that people, if they come and talk to you, only want to talk about football or think that you only want to talk about football? Well, they do. As I say, when, when I go out for a presentation, whatever, I want to shut off. But if, with your friends, you know, you, you've got to keep talking and talking and talking over the same things again. Well, I've said it, you know, in TV, you're locked in on and on and on. But you, you have to, you have to talk about it, and they're your friends, so you have to keep in with them. Do you ever try and change the conversation a bit and bring in something that you want to talk about? I if there's something good you've seen on telly last night, or I try to, as I say, but uh, as I say, they just over, overall, you know, I mean, they go back straight into football again. But uh, you can't do that, really. Dennison with the corner, flicked on by Thompson. Ball, Steely Ball's done it. Outside of football, um, you've got two dogs here at the house. They're quite a handful, aren't they? Two tellers. Yeah. Yeah. They are the good dogs, they say. They keep the girlfriend company, me and myself company. But they, they're good lads, they say. They, they break us up really, they say. We, we take them for walks over the mountain now and have a good, they say, keeps me fit as well. They look pretty vicious chaps. I mean, one of what the bigger one is apparently the friendlier one. Yeah, yeah King King and Sam, like, uh, King's the big one and uh, he's the one that usually looks after Sam, but Sam's bossing him about now, but... Uh, they are, they are a handful. But Sam's not, not very old and already <laughs> looks as though he's going to... Well, he's going to be he's gonna be a giant. He's, say, he's 14 weeks old now, but... Uh, they're not ferocious at the moment. They say, if I go to eat the girlfriend or whatever, they'll, they'll go for me. You know what I mean? They'll have me straight over. No trouble. What about taking him out for exercise? Is that full-time occupation? It's, it's like that, you know, two, two dogs and two legs. You, your arms are out and everything. You come back, your arms are bigger than you, what they should be, but they're all right. Good company as well for your girlfriend. Very good. As I say, I, I go on the England trips and I go on, you know, in the Wolves trips and everything. And as I say, she, she's got somebody to shout at. <laughs> <laughs> well, she shout at you when you're home then? Or well, what? a few times. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, obviously, going, being away a lot of the time with Wolves and England, um, does that make you appreciate being home even more? Well, it does. It, it, it makes me appreciate how much you need a girlfriend and how much you need somebody to come home to. As I say, you come into an empty house, it's, it's, it's not nice. As I say, now you've got a girlfriend in this, it's, it's great. But then again, I bet she has to be on the receiving end of all the uh, swearing and the bad language when you're getting after losing. Or? She does actually say, I'll come back and she, she looks at me and say, go on then, have you had say like whatever, <laughs> stuff like that. We, we just get it over with. What happens Saturday nights when you're at home? What time do you get away from the club? Uh, I'll get away from the club about six o'clock, half past six, and I'll get in here about quarter to seven, something like that. I'll fetch uh, the Argus and the Sporting Star, we the pipe, and say we get a video in and you'd have a, a, a bottle of wine down again. Mm. Do you go out a lot on Saturday nights? Or no, not much. We, we, we can't, you say, we, we've got no privacy at, at all. We can't just go out to the local and say hello, you know, we have a, have a couple of pints or whatever. We can't do that. They say it's invaded our privacy altogether. Does that bother you? Or? It, it doesn't bother me so much, you say, it's a girlfriend to say, when we're out there together, when you're eating a meal or whatever, you go for a meal and somebody goes, can you sign this for me, show it up your nose, whatever, you know, anything. Can't you just leave us alone, just to have a meal or something, be quiet. But at the end of the day, I suppose it's part and parcel of well, being a football. Well, that's it, that's, as you say, as you say it's, it's a price of fame. Right. But it's quite nice, therefore, I suppose, staying in is probably more pleasurable than going out to, well, to, it is, to a pub. It is, actually, you shut the curtain, you shut yeah. the doors, lock everybody out, you know, you put the telly on and have a nice talk and a chat and sit down in front of the fire.
and then wait for the Sunday papers. That's it, yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>